About eight years ago, I was fresh out of university and searching for meaning in my life. I had a job lined up at a prestigious international engineering consultancy, and I was due to start there that summer. A few weeks before I began the job, I got a call, and it was from my future employer, who told me that because of the global recession, they were having to reconsider the offers that they had made to some of their graduates. So my career started with me getting fired before I even began my first job. I think that's quite an achievement. But actually, it's probably on reflection one of the best things that could have happened to my career. And it gave me an opportunity to think about what I really wanted to do to maximize my、uh, impact in this life. And it was around this time that I discovered this image. I don't know if you can see it very well,、um, but this is a photograph that was taken on Valentine's Day in the year 1990 by a NASA space probe called Voyager 1. It's a photo that was taken from about six billion kilometers away, and just about in this photograph, you can make out a pale blue dot. That is Earth. That's us. That's right here. And what really struck me about this image is how isolated we are in the vastness of the universe, and how we have to be self-sustaining. It ignited a passion in sustainability for me to understand really how we could achieve that. It's probably a good thing that this photograph was taken from so far away, because given it was Valentine's Day, you never know what might have been caught on the photograph if it was been from too much closer. But herein lies the problem, as I see from this image. If you think about it, everybody who has ever lived or died in the entire history of mankind has done so on that pale blue dot. All of our achievements, everything we've ever done, has been on that pixel. So it's really important that we think about how we manage this going forward. The Earth has been around for about 4.5 billion years. Homo sapiens, maybe 200,000, and it's really only the last 200 years that humanity has grown and prospered. And it can be traced back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the steam engine, and by association, our ability to generate electricity from steam. This made energy more useful and accessible than ever before. We were able to light our homes, warm our homes, to travel, to communicate, to improve our productivity in ways we could never do before. But of course, these resources come from fossil fuels. The industrial revolution was powered by fossil fuels, and coal, gas, and oil are, by very definition, finite. They took millions of years to form, and we're using them at a rate of decades. Now we can debate how long we have left of them, but what we cannot debate is whether they will run out. They are, by very definition, unsustainable forms of energy, and so we have to be thinking differently about this if we are to create a self-sustaining pale blue dot. And unfortunately, we have within our solar system an energy source with over five billion years worth of fuel left in it. I am, of course, talking about the sun. The sun sends about 174 petawatts of energy to the Earth, average all the time. Now, a petawatt is an immense number. It's 174 with 15 zeros after it. This is like a quadrillion watts. It's not far off a ballpark of the number of grains of sand that are estimated to be on Earth. And granted, a lot of this energy. Is lost in the process of reflection or in the efficiency of capture through renewable technologies. But even if you account for those losses, then the supply still far outweighs our primary energy consumption. On the left in this diagram, you can see the different types of renewable resources that we get on average every year from the sun. And the, on the right, you can see the fossil fuels, which we still have fairly substantial reserves of. But these do not renew every year. These are one use only, and the bubbles will shrink each year we use them. But to me, this tells us where we should be focusing our attention. Unfortunately, the two largest bubbles there of renewable energy, solar and wind, are also already cost competitive today. The cost of these technologies has fallen to a point where, in many countries, they are already the cheapest forms of electricity generation, and that trend is set to continue. Solar 
has fallen roughly 25% in cost for every doubling of installed capacity that we've seen historically. And it still only makes up a relatively small percentage of our total generation. So this trend has plenty of room to continue. And it forms an important first step of a plan where we could actually live sustainably within our means. We have to accelerate the adoption of renewable energy in the global market. But it's not where the story ends, because even if we do accelerate renewables, electricity is not all of our energy consumption. We have to electrify everything as well. Heat and transport are predominantly provided from fossil fuel generation today. If we can move those energy consumptions onto electricity as well, we know already that it's technically feasible to provide all of that energy from renewables, and this would be self-sustaining. And again, this trend is happening. We're seeing it happen. Heat is moving onto the electricity grid through electric heat pumps and transportation through electric cars. In 2025, Bloomberg New Energy Finance project that the cost of an electric car will fall below the cost of conventional combustion engine. And this is just the upfront cost. Over the lifetime of an electric vehicle, the cost of production of energy to run it is far, far lower than of a petroleum car. So this change is happening far more rapidly than maybe many people actually realize. But there is, of course, one more critical piece that's holding back this clean energy revolution. It's kind of an obvious problem. The sun doesn't shine at night. And dealing with the intermittency challenge of renewable energy, the variability of wind and of solar, is one of the major challenges that really attracted me in the last eight years to focus my career on, to understand these issues and how we might overcome them. And you can probably tell what I'm building to, that we need to let go of an outdated notion. Our whole electricity infrastructure has been designed on the premise that energy cannot be stored. And this is fundamentally wrong. Energy storage holds the key to transforming our entire energy system. With the ability to store energy, we are able to completely transform the way we approach the design of an electricity system like we have never done before. Now, there are many different technologies that can enable this transition, the many different types of storage, but one of the most versatile and widely adopted today is the humble battery. I had a conversation on this exact oops, I had a conversation on this exact topic about six months ago with, uh, with this guy. I don't know if you recognize him. It's um, Bruce Dickinson. He's the lead singer of Iron Maiden. And he's also a, a commercial pilot, an investor, and an energy enthusiast. And it was in that latter role that I was honored to be introduced by him at a conference in Colombia. One Young World, um, giving a delegate keynote speech to about 1,300 people on the topic of sustainability. And it was at this event that I got talking to Bruce, and he was reflecting one of his um, concerns or issues with energy storage. He told me a story about his childhood where he always used to run downstairs on Christmas, e Christmas Day sorry, and uh, open up the presents under the tree and find on the back of those toys phrase, which you've probably all seen before, batteries not included. And it's this exact phrase that has, pray, um, that has plagued the renewable energy industry as well. Having an inability to store electricity has what has held back the clean energy revolution. But this is changing. And it's not actually a very new idea. If you look back into history, the battery was invented first in 1799 by Alessandro Voltaire. It's not even a new idea to use batteries on the electricity system. This is an extract from a journal publication over 120 years ago. Thomas Edison's Electric Light Company in New York. You may not be able to see it very well, but what this is doing is showing a battery charging and discharging. They were using energy storage over 120 years ago to decouple supply from demand for efficiency reasons. Whilst we're on the topic, it's not actually a new idea to do any of the other things I was talking about either. The electrification of transport. People may be surprised to see that back in 1900, 
120 years ago, again, almost 40% of all vehicles in the United States were electric. Now, I find that amazing, but neither of these technologies scaled at that time. And the reason they didn't scale was the technology wasn't ready. But batteries have fallen significantly in cost and improved in efficiency and density since those days. If you look at lithium-ion batteries at one chemistry alone, in the last five years, they have fallen over 70% in cost. And that trend is set to continue. The more the battery energy storage costs fall, the more jobs they can economically displace conventional technologies, conventional solutions providing. And I'm going to talk about just one of those. Here is one of the challenges that we typically associate with renewable integration. This is the average profile produced by a solar farm on a sunny day. So intuitively, you get most of your electricity in the middle of the afternoon when the sun is highest in the sky. Now, being creatures of habit, typically we consume our electricity in the evening. And this creates a mismatch. The energy from solar falls away to zero just as when we need it at the highest amount. And the way we've dealt with that historically has been to pay not to use free zero carbon energy. We pay to turn off wind, we turn down solar. It's economically ridiculous to do that. And then we pay again, if that wasn't bad enough, to run dirty fossil fuel generation into the evening period to fill in the gaps. This is chronically inefficient. And what we should be doing instead, and what we can be doing, is storing the excess energy in the day when it's available and shifting it just a few hours and discharging it into the evening period. And this is not a theoretical idea. My company, Fluence Energy, is doing exactly this with projects around the world. Most substantially, a 100 megawatt, 400 megawatt hour battery in California, which is being built as we speak, to do exactly this, help absorb renewable energy in the day and provide a controlled dispatch into the evening period. Now, I realize this, if it's new to you, is probably quite an abstract concept. So I'd like you all to close your eyes just for a second and try to imagine what one of these systems actually look like. When I'm talking about a megawatt size battery that can serve tens to hundreds of thousands of homes, what's actually in your mind? What does it look like? How much space does it take? If you've got something roughly in your head, then open your eyes. This is one such system that we've deployed. And I don't know if it's surprising to you or not, but it rather looks like a modern data center. It's a warehouse type building, and you have server racks, but instead of hard drives racked into them, you have rows and rows of battery modules. The individual cells that go into those battery modules, they can look rather like the double A's that are inside this clicker, but maybe a different size. They may look like the ones that you have in your mobile phone or your laptop. They're not very dissimilar. But you have many hundreds of thousands of these put together and some power electronics equipment that links the battery charge and discharge to the actual jobs that need to be done on the grid. But the point is, fundamentally, you could be living next to something like this instead of a smokestack, instead of a peaker. And there's a lot of reasons why you should be doing that. If we compare energy storage head-to-head -head with peaking generation, it wins out in almost every way. The first is in terms of scalability. Batteries you can have right down at domestic level, potentially in a residential dwelling, all the way up to these very large data centers in the central part of the grid. Peakers are very difficult to locate anywhere because no one wants to live near them, understandably. The second point is how quickly they can be deployed. Storage can be deployed in a matter of months. It can take years or even decades to get a peaker with planning permission because of all the environmental issues, because of the objections, because of the various permitting issues that they face. Third, batteries are always doing something useful. They respond faster than the human eye blinks. And that means that they're able to constantly be helping balance supply and demand, regulating frequency, helping with voltage issues, helping with providing capacity during key times. Whereas a peaker takes minutes, maybe even 15 minutes, before it's fully up to speed and providing a useful service on the grid. And for that reason, on a utilization standpoint, batteries are almost 100% of the time making money for you. They're doing something useful that's valuable for the electricity system. Peakers, on average, in the United States, spend about 95% of the time sat there doing nothing. 
and your money is paying for those through your electricity bill. So this is just one illustration of how energy storage delivers a much more effective solution than traditional ones in the past. And it's a whole new paradigm that's going to transform the way we power our world. And it's important that you have a vision of what it has looked like. If you don't have an open mind as to what the future of the energy system could look like, you'll always be imagining it as it is today. We need to start thinking about some of the jobs that need to be done and not the methods by which we achieve them. If we can do that, energy storage can displace many of the traditional roles that we've seen other solutions play on the electricity grid in our past. The peaker is just the tip of the iceberg. And if we can do that, then we're on track for that three-step plan. To accelerate renewables, to electrify everything, and to transform the grid with energy storage. That is the blueprint for a self-sustaining pale blue dot. Clean, reliable, and affordable energy for all, forever. And yes, it will come batteries included. Thank you.